am pleased to welcome John Butman here today. As you know, he is the author of Breaking Out. Uh, have a big, sorry, the full title is Breaking Out, How to Build Influence in a World of Competing Ideas. He's also the founder and principal of Idea Platforms, which happens to be just down the street here in Kendall. Uh, so he works um, at Idea Platforms and he works with other content experts around the world, helping them develop and go public with their ideas in a variety of expressions and forms, from social media to apps to print, uh, to print books and videos. He's worked with leaders in universities and philanthropies, consultancies and businesses, as well as independent professionals. Uh, his work has actually taken him to 30 different countries. Uh, I wish my book did that. <laughs> his clients and their ideas have been featured in dozens of publications. They have been featured in speaking venues worldwide, including the World Economic Forum at Davos, PopTech, and TEDx. Um, they've also been included in the Thinkers 50 list. Uh, their books have appeared on the New York Times, Boston Globe, Business Week, and Toronto Globe and Mail bestseller lists. Breaking Out in particular has been featured in the Financial Times, Forbes, Inc.com, Huffington Post, Harvard Business Review, Bloomberg, and plenty more than I'll leave off. Uh, but personally, I've read the book. I really enjoyed reading it. Um, in fact, I shared the book with my brother, uh, who was a Googler here too, and also an author. Um, and he really enjoyed it, and hopefully can share it with others, because that's a part of how ideas are spread. But I don't want to give you know too much or anything away about the book, because this is why we brought John here today. So I'll hand it over to John. Thank you, Katie. <clears throat> Great. Thank you very much, Katie. Thanks, you, thanks to everybody for coming. Uh, happy pre-lunch to you. Um, I am indeed the principal of Idea Platforms. I, Anna Weiss is my colleague and associate. She was very involved in the writing and creation of the book, too, so I want to acknowledge her. Um, and the, um, the title of my talk today is, if we make this go, How Do People Gain Influence for an Abstract Idea? So it's a very simple question I'm addressing, and the, the question is if you have an idea for how you would like to make a difference in the world, how you want to make some kind of change in the world, um, there is the world out there, there are people whose minds you want to influence, whose thinking you want to influence, and whose behavior you want to change, and in between is this thing that I call the ideaplex, which is all the stuff, all the channels, and all the ways you get to people. So how do you go from the idea in your head to the idea in other people's heads? Very difficult to do. Uh, that's what I've been studying. That's what I've been, we'll be talking about today. So two important things about, about this um, is I'm talking about people, not about companies. So it's about how do individuals do this. And I'm talking about abstract ideas. So I'm not talking about ideas for companies or for, um, for products. So when I say abstract idea, uh, let me just give you a few examples so you know what I'm, what I'm talking about. <clears throat> so for example, um, abstract idea, you know, Civil disobedience, abstract idea. I can never, I can never spell when I'm doing this. Um, I like to both, you know, do the pen thing and the click thing. I feel that you need two ways to uh, apprehend. Um, leaning in. This was probably familiar to you. You know, recognize that one, right? Uh, creative destruction. <clears throat> All right, I told Anna this one yesterday, and she said, I never heard of that one before. Continuous improvement. Um, interestingly enough, I mean, here's one that's, that's been around and it's become so embedded, we don't even think of it as an idea anymore. But when it first, first started, some 50 years ago, this, this was a big idea, it was an abstract idea that people didn't, didn't really get. They thought, you just kept on going. Um, anybody want to volunteer abstract idea? <clears throat> Well, that, oh, yeah, quantified self. It's, I like this one. Quantified self is kind of a new one. Um, so this is the kind of thing I'm talking about. You know, how do these ideas get out there? So <clears throat> my goal with this talk is twofold. First of all, I would like to um, help you if you want to go public with an idea, if you have an idea that you would like to plant in some minds, whether it's just within your community or within your discipline or within your unit or the world at large. And second, there are so many ideas out there coming at us that I would like to give you some thoughts about how to evaluate these ideas that are constantly you know, flooding around us. So <clears throat> let me first just talk a little bit about the Ideaplex, because this is, this is um, 
one of the reasons that we have this glut of ideas. So by the ideaplex, I mean all the activities by which we generate, distribute, and consume ideas. And what's interesting is uh, the countries that Anna and I visited uh, as part of the research for the book, the ideaplex in the, in the US is really different and much bigger and much more complex than anywhere else. So the idea entrepreneur, who I'm going to talk about in just a moment, is really a, a product of the ideaplex. And I'm talking about from uh, the entire educational uh, system to social media, traditional media in between, think tanks, research and development. I mean, there's so many places that ideas are coming from. So the IdeaPlex makes it easier to go public because you can just post a YouTube video, you can just tweet, and you are, you are public. But it makes it harder to gain influence because everybody's tweeting and everybody's going public. So it's interesting that it's easier and harder at the same time. Um, but it has given rise to this new, new player that I call the idea entrepreneur. So this is an individual. These are some of the characteristics. It's an idea-driven person. They tend to be outsiders to a status quo of some kind. They can be within an organization, but still be um, outside the status quo thinking. They tend to model the ideas themselves. The ideas are always life-affirming in some way. They are very personally motivated, and they always seek some kind of change. So they're looking to make some kind of change in something. It can be a mindset, it can be an organization, uh, it can be quite small, it can be quite large. So um, who am I talking about? Let me give you, just give you a few examples. Cheryl Sandberg. So she wrote the book Lean In. What's she trying to change? She's trying to change attitudes about women in the workplace and in society. Daniel Kahneman, anybody read his book, Thinking Fast and Slow? So he, he's a behavioral psychologist. He's trying to change how people go about making decisions. And he gets into business decision making. <clears throat> Marie Giuliano, have you read her book, French Women Don't Get Fat? So she's trying, to, she's trying to change how people think about eating and lifestyle. And her basic thing is you should do it the way the French do it. Atul Gawande, everybody know him? So he's trying to change how uh, surgeons think about the, the ways they behave in the operating room. He wrote the, the Checklist Manifesto. Very interesting fellow, and I've seen him speak. Uh, Tim Ferriss, anybody a Tim Ferriss adherent? <laughs> Is anybody, you are? My email. For the work week, the body, or the, what are all three? The work week, okay. <laughs> so Tim Ferriss is trying to change how you think about sort of everything, right? Um, but he's saying you should do everything faster and you should optimize yourself, and he's a self-quantification guy. Um, you probably haven't heard of this guy, Bindishwar Patak. We met him in India, fascinating guy. He is trying to change how Indians think about sanitation. He believes that sanitation is the way to, um, for success for the nation of India. These are, actually this is a group of, uh, of uh, these are the uh, untouchables, right? Former scavengers, who we had a chance to meet in India. Eckhart Tolle, maybe read Eckhart Tolle, The Power of Now, Huge, hugely successful author and speaker. He's trying to change how people think about um, being in the moment, and about spirituality. Brian Terry, he is, um, he's a chef, and he's into, into nutrition. He's trying to change how you think about social justice. He says nutrition is the way to social justice. Now, I just want to, uh, those people are all quite famous and quite well known, so I want to show you a couple who are not. This is uh, Maria Madison, who, actually lives in my town of Concord, Mass, and she's trying to change how people think about their community. So she is doing it in a very small way. She runs this little group called the Drinking Gourd Project. And this is a young woman named Samantha Joseph, who is a friend of, of Anna's. She works for Iron Mountain, and she's trying to change how people within the company think about sustainability. So all the ideas I'm going to present to you, although we've basically focused on well-known people who have, you know, best-selling books, these apply within communities. The ideas applies, apply within communities and within organizations. So finally, Caesar Milan, uh, the dog whisperer. Does everybody know this, the dog whisperer? Have you seen him, seen his shows? So um, they are all very different, obviously, but they all follow a, a basic method. It's not really a set of steps, but there are three parts to this method. Fascination, expression, and respiration. It's going to very briefly take you through those, those three things. So um, the first one, fascination. <clears throat> if we look at um, Caesar Milan, he's got a great story. He was, he was, he was uh, born in Mexico. He was raised on a farm. 
spent time on a farm as a kid. Um, everybody discovered that he was really good with dogs. He seemed to be able to communicate with dogs unlike anybody else. And when he was in his early teens, his family got a TV set for the first time. And he came across American shows. And believe it or not, his favorite show was Rin Tin Tin. And then he came across Lassie. And he said, wow, this is really very different. The, the way these dogs behave is not the way the dogs behave on the farm here in Mexico. I must go to America and discover what the training techniques are for these dogs because these dogs understand English, they respond to commands, <laughs> they seem to have relationships, they live in houses, they wear clothing. I don't get, I don't get what's going on. So, he, um, so this was a, a, a moment of revelation for him. Now, so his fascination with dogs has remained a part of his presentation for his entire life, so for the last 30 years. And this particular story, he tells over and over again. I went to see him uh, do a, a live, he does this live talk, this hour-long kind of stage show. Went to Lynn, Massachusetts and saw him do this. And he told this story about seeing Rin Tin Tin. He tells it every time he talks, virtually, and every time he talks about it, he says it as if it happened yesterday. So, you know, these are, so the fascination um, is, is about these, um, iconic moments, <clears throat> and all of these idea entrepreneurs have these iconic moments that, that reveal the idea. So they, they are able to tell you, here's when I came to understand this idea. Um, Marie Giuliano, for example, French woman who don't get fat, she talks about how she came to America when she was a kid, and she... <laughs> She was a perfectly slim, fit, young French woman. She came here. She lived in five different homes. As she, when she was a, a high school student, everybody plied her with lemon meringue pie and brownies and fraps and stuff like that, and she gained 20 pounds. And it really did not make her happy. She went home. Her father said to her, oh, my God, you look like a sack of potatoes. <laughs> so that, that moment is one that she talks about all the time. So these iconic moments are um, very much a part of, of fascination. Then there is, uh, all these idea entrepreneurs have huge quantity of accumulation. So they accumulate lots and lots and lots of material. And what we find is, uh, uh, as, um, as Katie said, we, um, we, we work with people who come to us who are content experts and want to go public, and often they want to write a book. And they say to us, do we have enough material? And very often they do not have enough material. And you really need a great deal of material behind your idea to convince people in lots and lots of different ways. So you need, you, know, you need data, you need stories, you need references, you need analysis, um, you, need, you need all this stuff. And um, a friend of mine, George Stock, who's a strategy expert, said, well, he has a test for you know, how much material you need, because he's always asked how much do you need before you can write a book. He said, well, if you can stand up in front of an audience for a full day and talk nonstop, and have the audience stay you know, reasonably awake, you probably have enough for a book. So you can use that test if you want to write a book. Uh, they also, they always have practices. So all of these idea entrepreneurs are very practical people. And this is what really distinguishes them from the, uh, the abstract thinkers, the academics, those who are interested in writing books, and, uh, but, but don't make it practical. So what we found is that they really uh, have to find a way to allow people, make people understand how do you put this idea into everyday use. So obviously, Caesar Milan gives you ways to deal with your dog, but Daniel Kahneman gives you a series of questions to ask before you make a decision. All of these guys, all of these people um, give you practices. <clears throat> it's very, very important. So they take all of this stuff and they, they build a personal narrative around their idea. And what's really great is the personal narrative is the story of the idea. It's the story of how the idea developed. It's, it's the abstraction of the idea, but it's the life story, so the person essentially becomes the idea. This is very difficult to do. Um, all the people that I showed you pretty much do that. But you can do it in, in a smaller way. So you can say, you know, that person is the one who knows more than anybody else in the organization about whatever it is, and that is the person who is really espousing this idea and has put themselves into it. So their personal narrative is, is really entwined with the idea. So the second, the second uh, part of the method is expression. Now, obviously, the fast, all these, these three overlap and they're, they're simultaneous, but the expression comes next. 
So by expression, I simply mean that your idea is, is pretty much nothing until you have expressed it in some way. And we, I've done many talks, and people come up to me after and say, I have this really fantastic idea, but nobody is doing it. And I'll say, well, um, have you told anybody about it, for example? We'll say, yeah, well, I told, uh, I told somebody about it. But the idea entrepreneurs express their ideas in multiple ways all the time. So the first thing they do is they figure out what is their best form of expression. And this is not so easy to do, because uh, if you don't spend your life in, um, in communications, you may not know what your best form is. So we, we found uh, people come to us who want to write books um, are, are not actually writers, and it's very difficult to write. And so we help them try to find what their best expression is. So very often, people are, are much better talkers than they are writers, and that's where idea entrepreneurs should start. So Cesar Milan, for example, he's a great talker. Uh, he's great in, pres in, in person, but as a writer, I mean, he's, he's fine. His books are fine, but you really want to see the guy. Marie Giuliano is, is actually a very good writer. You, you want to read her books. They are, they are fun to read. They're interesting to read. And she likes to talk, but it's, it's kind of secondary to her. So this, this writing, uh, <coughs> speaking tension is, is very intriguing because you really need to do both. And they do very different things. We found that all idea entrepreneurs do both of these things. But whatever their best form in it is, and even if they do both, they always create what, what we call a sacred expression. So this is the one expression that everybody comes to recognize, and they say, oh, that is the one. That is the, the book this person wrote. That's the one you should read. And if you don't have that, it's very hard to go up a level when you go public. So people who really want to take it up a level and go public and get a lot of attention, they really have to put a lot of work into the expression. And it's not enough just to write a book, just to do a video, just to do a talk. You have to put a lot into it. But all the accumulation, all the iconic moments, all the practices, they all have to be there in the sacred expression. And then you have to put a lot of work into, make it, into making it both quality, but also get out there so people, people see it. Um, finally, they, they do, as I said, multiple expressions. And what they really want to do is create you know, a video, a talk, tweet, blog, write, write articles, appear in conferences, appear at TED Talks if they possibly can. But every piece of each expression does something a little bit different. So when I first saw Malcolm Gladwell speak, it was really interesting. He, was, he did a, a talk about the tipping point. And I don't know if you've seen him talk about that. And I'm not sure if he changed this or not. But when I saw him, it was just after it came out. And he got up and he told the first story from the book. And basically in the same words that he had written it in the book. And I thought, well, I've already read the book. You know, I don't need you to read the book aloud. I, there's, there's audio to do that. So I don't, I'd rather have you tell me other stuff and explain, explain to me things in the book or tell me other stories. So th the great idea entrepreneurs make their talk different from the book. I've, I found this very difficult when we started off with this book because you spent three, four years working on all this stuff in your book and then suddenly <laughs> You know, nobody wants to hear that. They want to hear new stuff. You say, well, I, sp I don't have any new stuff right now. <laughs> but you have to come up with new stuff. So the, the talk has to be different from the book. The video has to be different from the talk and the book. So all these multiple expressions start to build this self-reinforcing platform that's really fantastic. And we've seen this with our book. It's been really, really fun to watch because <clears throat> we've been blogging on the HBR uh, blog network, which has, I, I think it goes out to a million people. So I don't know if you, anybody looks at that, the blog network, but blo they have five or six blogs per day. And they're always doing, running their analytics on them so you can see you know, where you fall in the ranking. It's, it's, this is very dangerous for, for, for an author to do this because you can waste your entire day checking your analytics of your Amazon ranking and you know, where you fall in the blog uh, uh, hierarchy. But you want to build this, this self-reinforcing platform. And that's what all the idea entrepreneurs do. <clears throat> um, then we come to the, uh, the third piece, which is, which is really the most important and fun one. Am I going to write on the wall if I do this? Yeah. I was told not to write on the wall. At, I would be kicked out immediately. <laughs> All right, so I'll, I'll, I'll squeeze it in down here while you do that. 
so respiration. Now, this, this is the most important one. This is where influence really starts to happen. So you can, you know, you can have a fascination. You can accumulate a ton of material. You can create a lot of expressions. And you can have absolutely no influence at all. And it happens all the time. And this happened to a couple of our clients. And it's a very unpleasant experience. You know, you put all this work into it. Um, y usually, we find that putting all the work into it will pay off eventually. But it may not pay off with this particular effort. So what is respiration? Now, this is when the idea comes to life, when the idea starts to breathe, when people pick it up, when they tell each other about it, when they start to put it into practice. All these things happen. So this is what you really want to have happen to your idea to make some kind of change. Now, it's, you cannot force this to happen, but you can encourage it. So there are a lot of things you can do. So the first one, first thing you can do is you have some kind of direct engagement. Um, I, I, the number of authors we've worked with who feel that once the book is done, or once the video is done, or once the talk is done, it's done. I have presented my idea under the world. The world will now completely understand it. They will take it on board. They will act accordingly. My work is finished. I can ride off into the sunset, right? So this never happens. Never ever happens. Even if they do go give a talk, just like I'm giving now, um, they don't actually ask for questions or don't listen to what people say. And so there's no direct engagement. So all the, the successful idea entrepreneurs have some kind of direct engagement. Eckhart Tolle is, I, I think he's sort of my model for this. He has so many ways of, of, of engaging directly with audiences. He tried to do sort of big tent shows where he would go into, I don't think he went to Madison Square Garden, but he went to very big venues. And he didn't like it because he's kind of a, a shy guy. What he likes to do is be in a, in a video studio with an audience about the size of this group. And people will get up and ask him really deep, probing, personal questions like, I'm about to commit suicide. What do you think I should do? <laughs> oh my god. And you know, he will say, oh, well, uh, and he's, he, you can see him kind of stumbling. And he's, he's, he's not polished. He's really trying to help this person. He's directly engaging. And when he does it, Something magical happens in the audience because you see this guy is putting his ideas to work right here with somebody who has a real problem. And you see that the person is, is helped in some way. Um, Cesar Milan does the same thing on stage. He, he brings on dogs who he's not met before who have problems, presenting problems, <laughs> right? So when I saw him, uh, he, the dog was a barker. Yeah, he barked at, he barked at every dog who went by. And Caesar, really within three minutes, he had, this dog was totally changed. He, it was just by his presence, by the way he behaved with the dog, but Caesar had the new dog, the, the dog had come out, he had, he, and he walked his own dog named Junior by, and the guest dog had barked like crazy at Junior, and tried to, you know, pull the, uh, tried to pull it at, the, at his leash. And at the end of it, after three minutes, Caesar walked by with Junior, and the dog just something like, <laughs> no problem, there's another dog here, I, you know. So um, direct engagement is absolutely essential. The second one is uh, we're still in uh, respiration now, current presence. Now, I don't know if you've witnessed this, but, but very often if you hear an author or somebody with, with a set of ideas uh, interviewed on the radio or on TV, they will often say the, those, these, those killing words, as I said in my book, no one cares what you said in your book. They want to know what you think about what's happening right now. So every idea entrepreneur has to find a way to develop a framework of ideas that is stable, that they believe in, that they don't change all the time, but that they, they can interpret and apply to what's going on right now. So uh, all the good ones will be able to take their ideas and apply them to whatever is happening. And then people have, you know, they get the, what, what I call this current presence. So uh, Deepak Chopra, you know Deepak Chopra? He's quite brilliant at this. He's so brilliant at it that he's kind of lost, <laughs> he's kind of lost the framework. He's so much a personality of the Ideaplex, and he's so able to respond to everything. Remember, he was all over the place when Michael Jackson died. So he was some, somehow, Deepak Chopra was the expert on, on Michael Jackson. <laughs> I, I'm not quite sure why, but it's sort of like, if you need somebody to talk about anything, call Deepak. <laughs> He will apply his ideas. He'll fix them somehow so they fit. <clears throat> so 
from my point of view, he's kind of lost the idea thing, and he's become a personality of the ideaplex. Contrast him to uh, Jim Collins, for example, who you know, has, done, has done four books, basically four major books. At, at, in a pretty uh, Deepak Chopra, by the way, has done 65 books in his 30 years, so there's quite a difference there. But he's, he's very, very much sticks with his ideas. He evolves them over time. You know, he looked at, um, he, he said, well, how do my ideas apply to the social sectors and did this little monograph? So there's a way to have a current presence which doesn't threaten your ideas, but it also keeps you, keeps you current. Uh, very important, okay, I'm continuing respiration here, is <clears throat> they um, personally model the practices. So once they go public, and they've, they've talked about these practices, but um, they, um, they model them as, as things continue. So two examples. Martha Stewart, who I think of as an idea entrepreneur, she kind of got a little bit uh, focused on the money for quite some time, but she started off as an idea entrepreneur, and the great thing about her is she has practices, obviously. I mean, she's got more practices than you can shake a stick at. She's got nothing but practices, really. And what happened when she went to prison? Does anybody know? I mean, the, the reports vary. It's a little hard to get the exact story, but as far as we can tell, she taught people how to do yoga. She cooked. She did knitting or crocheting. And she advocated for better food in prisons, from prison. So she didn't, you know, become angry. She didn't shut down. She kept doing her practices. I thought, this is pretty good. And to me, okay, she had her problems with the whole financial thing. I don't know what happened there, really. But she kept going with her practices. Contrast that with um, Al Gore. Remember Al Gore and his whole thing with the, the carbon footprint? So he came out with an Inconvenient Truth. He's the only guy who's, who has a PowerPoint presentation that led to a Nobel Peace Prize and an Academy <laughs> Award. <laughs> That's not bad. I think that's, you know, well, anyway. Um, but he, uh, while, he was, while he was out there going public with his ideas, he got a lot of backlash because of his enormous house, his enormous jet. He was flying around all the time, and his carbon footprint was just way off, so he was not modeling the practices. Now, as far as I can tell, Al has changed his ways. He's got a smaller house, and he's, he's reduced his carbon footprint. So he heard that message. But you've got you to model the practices. That's very, very important. Um, two other things in respiration. One is you're always going to have backlash. If, there's, if you have an idea of any intensity, you're going to have to um, expect that you're going to get backlash of some kind. So <clears throat> you hope you get very intense positive reactions, but you're probably going to get very intense negative reactions. So my favorite example of this is uh, Amy Chua. Remember her? She wrote a book called The, the Tiger. Uh, the, Battle Hymn of the Tiger Mother. Yeah, so this was, what, two or three years ago? Oh, my God. Remember, there was huge, huge hyperventilation. Uh, it wasn't respiration. It was beyond respiration to hyperventilation <laughs> in, in, the, in the Ideaplex. Everybody went nuts. On the Wall, there was an excerpt from the Wall Street Journal um, from her book, and I forget how many comments. I think it had 9,000 comments. It, had, it got more comments than any other article had ever received for the Wall Street Journal before or since. So, um, and she was really not prepared for this. I mean, you know, she went out thinking, I am presenting what I think are some good ideas about parenting. <laughs> and wow, she did, she did not expect this to happen. And part of it was she ran into some, some pretty heavy trends in the zeitgeist. You know, that was a time when we were all worried about China and said, oh my God, China is going to completely eat our lunch. And every parent was worried about their kids saying, oh, oh my God, we're, none of our kids are gonna get into college. And so Amy Chu was saying, you know, really, all the parenting techniques uh, here in America, they're fine and everything, but we could use a little more of the hard and uh, metric-driven parenting. So parents went insane. So you have to expect this backlash, and you have to find a way to not try to rebut it, but encompass it. So Caesar Milan, for example, he has taken a great deal of backlash. He does not have a degree in veterinary science. He didn't go to, he does not have a college degree at all. And so the, the establishment doesn't like him. And they say he set back dog training 20 years. And he just deals with that. He says, this is, you know, people feel this way. This is how I operate. Uh, it's, just, it's just part of the thing. And the final part of um, <clears throat> respiration is the meta story. And this is one, this is really part of the ideaplex. This is, this is part I find really fascinating. People have 
come to be as interested in the story of getting your story out there as they are in the idea that you're actually getting out. So for a while they say, oh, that's really interesting. And with our book, for example, for a month or so they said, you know, I've read the book, interesting ideas, really interesting. But after about two months it was like, so how's it going? You know, how many books have you sold? Oh, you were on whatever, big think. So people really want to know the story of getting the story out there. And so ID entrepreneurs have started to always include the meta story in the story. And that to me is really fascinating. So people want, they want the idea, but they also want to know how it went and they want this validation of the fact that you're actually having success out there in the Ideaplex. So those two things go together. <clears throat> so that's the method. Now just a couple, um, just a couple of thoughts about some other issues. Because uh, this one is, is really critical to getting an idea out there. Now you'd, you'd sort of think that you would know who your key audience is, but it's surprising how often people do not know who they're talking to. And they're kind of talking to themselves. So they think, I have a really, really great idea. I really love talking to myself about this idea. I'm sure that other people really will love it too, so I think I'll write a book or I'll go public and they find that is really not always the case. Um, but more often there is a, an audience you think you want to influence. So Atul Gawande, the checklist doctor, he really wanted to influence surgeons and medical staff. And clearly that's his audience, but he had to go to an adjacent audience to really get to them. So you have your direct audience, but you may not be able to talk to them directly. You may have to go to an adjacent audience. So this is very intriguing. You know, Atul Gawande got picked up by the business community. I think more so than he got picked up by the medical community. And then it sort of went back to the direct audience. And they said, oh, well, I guess we better pay attention to this. So often you want to go to an adjacent audience to get back to your direct audience. So you've got to think about what are the adjacent audiences. You, don't, you often don't know. So uh, Marie Giuliano, the French woman don't get fat lady, she said, well, my direct audience is probably sort of middle-aged women, uh, well-educated, who have, you know, a weight, they're struggling with their weight or with their, with their health and lifestyle. So I want to talk to them directly. And they did read the book, but she found that she got more response from young mothers who were worried about the kids. So she had this whole young mother audience then she discovered that grandmothers were reading the book because they said, oh, this reminds me of how things were back in my day when we, you know, climbed the stairs all the time, didn't watch TV, and only ate uh, whatever. So she got, she kind of surrounded her direct audience. And then she discovered that the spouses were reading the book. Or the wife was saying to the husband, you know, this is a really great book, so all these guys were reading it. And then, I'm not sure if this is adjacent or not, but then she discovered that she had a gay audience. So she was do and she only discovered that because she did all this direct engagement. She would go out to book shows and do talks and she, you know, all these, all these gay guys were there. So she developed this uh, gay audience. So she built these separate audiences into, um, into a very large audience. <clears throat> and then there's a third one that I call the secret audience. And this is my favorite one because um, everybody I've worked with, including myself, usually has somebody in, usually it's often an individual that they are speaking to. They may not even know who it is, but it's often uh, an issue of revenge, <laughs> of, uh, of unfulfilled promise. So I'm, I'm writing for my third grade teacher who said I'd never amount to anything, or my father who, it's often my, my father who died when I was 10 and I couldn't show him whatever. Um, so. There's a secret audience, and you may not know who it is, but you may eventually get to it. And the reason it's important is it really helps you focus what you're trying to do, because you often think you have an audience, but, and it feels right, but then you really discover that you're, you're trying to say something a little different, and you're talking to different people. So usually that secret audience person represents the audience you really want to get to. So for example, uh, one of my secret audience members is my brother-in-law, and uh, <clears throat> we have a perfectly fine relationship and everything. But um, I wrote a book several years ago, and he, after, after he'd read it, which I appreciated, he said, I don't know why you wrote that book. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why you wrote that book. Why did you waste three years of your life on that book? And you know, he kind of had a point, because uh, 
the, my, my audience was not clear on that book. So I always have him in mind when I write to say, is he going to say, why did you write that book or not? <laughs> I'm really pleased to say when he read this book, he said, I really enjoyed that book. <laughs> it was really good. <laughs> I said, oh my god, Glenn, I, I've spent 10 years thinking about you. He didn't, he didn't know that. Um, so then we get to, uh, so we need another one. We got two. We got two. There, there are two. Okay, there are two there. Yeah. Um, so now we come to the question. So how do you measure this? You know, everybody says, well, what's, how do you measure influence? It's impossible to do because it's not about finance, right? It's, it's not not about money. So how do you measure the influence you're having on on people? How many people, etc. So you can't directly uh, measure influence, of course, because it's not financial, but you, there are a number of things you can measure. So you can measure all the expressions. <clears throat> so you can look at your, your books, your talks, and there are an amazing number of things you can measure. Book sales is just the most obvious thing. But you know, how many talks am I invited to? Uh, for academics in particular, how often are, are my ideas referenced in other works? That's a huge one. Daniel Kahneman says his first article about thinking fast and slow is the most referenced article of all time. I don't know. That's what he says. Uh, but anyway, it is referenced a lot. So are you referenced a lot? Um, are you invited to, um, you know, to lots and lots of talks? Um, how many people show up? How many Twitter followers do you have? They're just, I mean, they're just endless metrics that you can, you can look at. And th these are useful. However, I have also worked with clients who have great metrics that way and have no influence. So there's no direct correlation between any of those analytics and the influence that you have. So it's all a little bit <laughs> mysterious and upsetting. I can tell you, when clients come to us, uh, that answer does not make them very happy. They, they, they want to believe that it's about sales. And in fact, I had a chat with my doctor recently. We were just chatting and he said, so how's the book going? How many books have you sold? I said, well, actually, I, I don't know. I haven't checked. He's like, you what? You haven't checked your sales? I said, well, no, that's really not the point. He said, well, how else do you know anything about anything if you haven't checked the sales of your book? I said, doc, just, let's just get on with the exam, OK? <laughs> Um, however, you can, you can usually come up with some kind of metric that may or may not be measuring exactly what you do, but that helps people gauge what you're doing. So Caesar Milan, for example, uses euthanization of dogs. He says um, every year three to four million dogs are euthanized in the United States, and largely that's because people do not know how to behave with their dogs. Uh, he says that six to ten, six out of ten dogs that are taken home from shelters are returned to the shelters. There's some, I don't know if that metric's exactly right, but <clears throat> that's what he says. So those are two metrics that he can use, and he can say, well, you know, euthanizations are coming down, or fewer dogs are being returned to their shelters. Now, he can't directly say, I caused that to happen, but he can, he can look at those numbers. So you need some kind of metric you can look at. But uh, interestingly enough, the most affecting and most rewarding and probably most important one is this one-to-one -one people saying to you, you know what, I saw you talk, I read your book, it was really meaningful to me, it changed the way I think, it changed the way I behave, I do things differently now, I tell other people about it. And all the idea entrepreneurs we spoke with said that is the one that they found the most meaningful and the most, um, most really telling because you know that if you've directly affected somebody, they're going to be talking to other people in a way that's not just, oh, I read this cool book. It's like, this really meant something to me. So, you know, Tim Ferriss has this sort of gang of followers, right, who really, really believe him. So that one-to-one -one thing leads to a one-to-many. -one -to um, finally, you, you start to think about, so what is my very, very long-lasting effect beyond you know, beyond the book or beyond the two or three years when I go public. And we get to what I call the thinking journey. And this is where you connect the idea that you want to go public with to other ideas and think about how does it fit in a much bigger way. <clears throat> so you want to think about how do you take the idea, you know, beyond yourself when you're no longer active or you're onto something else. And there's, there are ways to think about that. One is, are you linking to some kind of fundamental human concern. And th this is something that a lot of um, people who want to write books in particular 
are not doing. They're, they're, they're focused on a, a very narrow or, or uh, technical area. But if you could link to a, a very deep fundamental human concern, you've got a pretty good chance of uh, gaining some lasting influence. So to use Caesar Milan again, for example, you know, he talks about dog training. People think of him, oh, he's a dog trainer. But he, he strongly believes that he's about dog-human relationships and that he's actually about the state of American society and our, our relationship with nature. So he's, he's linking into a much, much deeper idea. If you take any one of these idea entrepreneurs to always finding some fundamental idea that they're talking about. They don't always say it. They don't say it directly, but it, it comes out. Um, many people have this idea of ownership. I want to own that idea. Consultants in particular want to do this. We want to be the owner of that idea. And I've, I found that this is a really good way to not own an idea is to say, I own this idea, no one else owns this idea, I thought it up, nobody else did. So the good idea entrepreneurs say, you know, I didn't think it up, I am expressing it for lots of other people. I, of course, I added my own thing to it, and I express it in different ways, but, it, but I don't own this, I don't want to own it. I want other people to own it, I want other people to add to it. So don't try to own the idea. <clears throat> and you gotta, you gotta recognize the relationship of your idea to, to other ideas out there. And they're all, you know, no idea is, is wholly original, or even particularly original. But they're originally stated, and they come out at, at certain times that are, that are important. So link to those. And then finally, if you can, you want to trace to a very, very long uh, thinking journey. So you want to trace back, and you want to trace forward. So when I asked um, Cesar Milan, for example, um, I interviewed him, and I said, is there anybody that you whose footsteps you would like to follow him, or you think of as, uh, you know, as somebody who is kind of a mentor, a leader. He said, oh yeah, Gandhi. Like, Gandhi, really? He said, why? I said, why? He said, well, Gandhi has this quote, which is, the quality of a society is judged by the way it treats its animals. I thought, oh, this is pretty interesting. So if you take Caesar Milan, um, if you take Gandhi, his whole thing was what he called satyagraha, which is truth firmness, which is sort of civil disobedience. And Caesar's method of working with dogs is calm assertiveness, which is sort of the same thing for dogs <laughs> that Gandhi had for humans. And you can trace this thinking journey really back to Buddha. You can say Buddha, Gandhi, Tolstoy, Martin Luther King, Caesar Milan. <laughs> perfect, perfect line. <laughs> All right, so uh, I want to leave you with um, well, I guess I can, I, I forgot to uh, take you through metrics. So if you're thinking about going public with an idea, and maybe just within your organization or whatever, um, these are questions that we ask our clients to answer. And they, they, they're really obvious questions. And when I start to, when I show them to people, they sort of laugh like, these absurd questions. But they are very, very difficult to answer. And uh, you can, I'm sure you've heard people flounder with these, with these questions, trying to answer them in many, many situations. <clears throat> so for the idea entrepreneur, uh, I can give you the correct answer for each one of these. So the first one is, you know, why am I doing this? And I cannot tell you the number of times I've seen people who say that I want to go public with an idea, but they, they can't say why. What is driving them? Um, what is their purpose in doing this? So, and usually that means that their purpose is that they would like to become famous in the Ideaplex. They would love to have great blog analytics and have people say, wow, I read your cool book, that's really great, it was on the front shelf uh, at Barnes and Noble or whatever. That is, that is the wrong answer. The right answer is you want to <laughs> do something for other people and that is what's driving you. I'm not saying that these idea entrepreneurs are totally selfless, that they don't have healthy egos, but they really want to do something that changes the world for the better as they see it. Um, I found this for myself. You start working on a book, and you're so focused on, I got to get this book done. You know, can I get it done? What am I trying to say? But at some point, there's a, there's a flip, and you say, oh, I'm actually trying to help people out with this thing. Number two, um, what I want to achieve, and this sort of goes back to the metric. So very often, you kind of throw something out there and say, here's my idea. Uh, I'm, I'm doing it because of whatever, but there's no specific achievement that you're after. And whether or not that's the one you actually achieve or that's the one you keep focusing on, you want to keep saying, what specifically do I want to have happen? 
and that usually goes to the practices also. So do I want to see people referring to me? Do I want to see people referring to my ideas? Do I want to see them put them into practice? Um, this third one, what is my personal connection? This is really tough, and most of our clients really struggle with this. They don't, you know, we're, we're taught in organizations not to get personal, to keep it on the argument, keep it on the data, but you have to bring in these personal connections. Very tough to do. Who am I talking to? We talked about the audiences, but um, very often uh, somebody will go out with an idea and they will talk to the people who do not need to be convinced, people who are al already convinced. So you've got to find a way to that direct audience. And the final one is what is, what is my idea in a single sentence? Now this is really hard to do. I try to do it my, myself every day and I, sometimes I can't do it. But uh, you keep trying to refine it because the world will do that for you. They will say, oh, well, he's the guy who talks about the, the IdeaPlex thing, right? And that's all you're going to get, right? That's all you're going to get. So if your idea, if your sentence isn't really good and if you haven't shaped it for yourself, they're going to do it for you and you're not going to be happy with it half the time. So keep working on that. <clears throat> Sorry? Oh, yeah, I missed that one. We talked about that. Think about that. Your best form of expression. Um, so if after looking at these questions and thinking about your idea and who you're trying to reach, if you decide not to go public with your idea, I applaud you for that decision. It's a really, really good decision. <laughs> and more people should decide, I don't think I'm ready, or I don't think the idea is strong enough, or I don't think I can get to the audience, or I don't want to really deal with the idea plex. There, I think part of the reason we have this glut is that everybody thinks, oh, well, I'll just take it out and I'll take my idea and I'll change the world, it'll be great and don't do all this stuff. And so we have to sort of weed through all this stuff. So please, if you, don't, if you, if you say no to yourself, that's really good. Um, but if you think about these questions, you think, well, maybe I will. I, the, sort of the one question you can ask that's, that is absolutely definitive is, can I not not go public with this idea? If you are so driven that you don't care about everything I said, and you say, I cannot not help myself, I cannot not go public, then I say to you, Godspeed and good luck. <laughs> and thank you very much. <clears throat> so we've got a few minutes for questions or thoughts or comments. Yeah. I'm fascinated with the backlash, and I'd like to hear yeah. you found a little bit more on how to just say what you want to say about it, but <laughs> your observations. Well, you know, especially with social media, it's so easy for people to, to backlash at you. Um, it's... Um, it's, 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 it's a fundamental part of it. I think it's actually a healthy part of it. Because if you don't hear people's objections to your ideas, either they're being polite or your idea isn't really different enough and it's probably not worth considering. So you really actually want backlash and you want, you want intelligent backlash. You want considered backlash where you can actually engage in discussion with people. And then you need to, s to decide, so what's the cutoff point? You know, we, we've had people make comments on, on our blogs or in, on Twitter and you just say, well, you sort of look into the person and say, this is not coming from anywhere that's useful. And you just kind of ignore it. So, but it's very hard to do because idea entrepreneurs think, I am, I'm good. I'm trying to change the world for the better. And these people are thinking I'm bad. And it's, it's hurtful. So you just have to sort of accept that and say that it's actually a good, healthy part of the process. Yeah. Uh, you referred to some clients. Mm. Uh, I'm curious as to you know, what sorts of clients you have Businesses yeah, so um, I don't, I think I can't tell you exactly specifically who they are, but I can tell you sort of generically who they are. Uh, so we're working, for example, with, with the, uh, the president of a large philanthropic organization. And uh, she has, uh, uh, they have one basic theme that they want to get out to the world and say, this is where we're putting all of our money and all of our effort. So she's doing a whole campaign, she's doing a book, she's doing a bunch of other activities. So she authors the book. We're helping her think about the ideas and create the book. Uh, we're working with a uh, serial entrepreneur who is also um, a lecturer at the Media, Media Lab. And he's talking about the future of technology. So he wants to become sort of the guru of the next wave of technology. Uh, we are working with um, a guy who's been in investment for a long time. And he believes that the history of the, 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 the whole story of investment has never been told. And the reason that we are in such a mess financially is that people don't understand what to do with their money at all. And all they do is get tips from people who have uh, self-interest at heart. So he's, he wants to write this book and get it out there. 
Uh, yeah, so some of the, these people have, have the means to support this, and they're, they're going out. These are ones sort of at the, well, the, not the entrepreneur, but the other two are sort of at the end of their careers. Uh, we work with a number of consultants. We're working with a, a French consultant right now, and his whole, he's an organizational guy. So he believes that, uh, that organizations are dealing with complexity in all the wrong ways, that instead of uh, dealing with complexity by, through human intelligence, we're trying to make our organizations so rule-bound and complicated to try to cover every possible contingency, which is possible, uh, impossible. So those are some of the kinds of people we're dealing with. Yeah. Um, so let's go back a little bit to the, uh, uh, to the backlash yeah. question. But um, there's, you have uh, ideas that generate a lot of backlash. They get a lot of airtime. Right? Yeah. Because everyone loves right. debate. Yeah. Um, do you find that in the long run, the yeah. ideas that are the stickiest, that really sort of permeate and change thinking of everyone, do those tend to be going to generate less backlash up front or more backlash up front? Or do you, do you have a sense of that? Um, it's a really good question. I haven't really thought that one through. But I, my feeling is that people respond much better over the long run to, to people who are really genuine, are not deliberately trying to create controversy, and really want to help you. And the ideas may be difficult, but they're not deliberately controversial. So my hunch is, and I think this is probably your hunch, is that those ones that really spike and get a lot of attention tend to disappear. And the ones that really, that really last are the ones that are deeper and stronger, and they generate conversation, but not so much backlash. It's interesting, if you look at on the Harvard um, uh, blog site, there's a real difference between blogs that get a lot of comments and the ones that get a lot of readership. So very often there's one that gets a ton of comments, but they don't last very long. So it's just like sticking your finger in people's eye and they want to talk about it. It doesn't mean that it's, that it's, um, it's lasting. Yeah? Um, back to the restoration, a lot of what you talked about, um, how did you rank credibility? Like when you mentioned the season one, it really establishes tangible credibility for you immediately. And in both cases, they are their credibility. They're they're pretty immediately recognized, and so that's part of the influence is that there's an immediate recognition. Um, how do you factor in some of these ideas? Take time for um, the recognition of impact, and how how does that become a variable in influence? So uh, so how long does it take to? Yeah, I mean, does this, that matter? It does matter. You know, I think there's usually a very long accumulation period. And people are, they're doing all this stuff, they're doing respiration, they're doing expression, but it hasn't become really well known yet. So Cesar Milano did a lot of stuff, but then he got this TV show. He was actually approached to do a TV show, and that's, he just, it spiked him. Um, but Maria Giuliano spent four decades gathering stuff before people kept saying to her, you have to write this book, you have to write this book. She said, I want to write this book. My mother told me you should never write books because that's too self-aggrandizing. And her friend finally said, Forget about your mother, it's about helping other people because I've seen you do it. And she said, okay, now I understand that that's what it's for. So, um, I, you know, when people come to us and say, I want to be the thought leader in this thing by 2000, by the end of 2014, like, sorry, no can guarantee that. <laughs> you know, uh, you, you have to have accumulated the stuff. You have to go out there and create respiration, which you cannot be sure is going to happen. And it can take a long time. Yeah. Somebody else, yeah. If we want to get good at speaking, presenting, and uh, connecting with audiences, what are good ways to get practice? <laughs> that's, a great, that's a great question. You know, take like any invitation you can think of. And if you can't get any invitations, then, then call somebody you know and say, can I come over to your company at lunch and talk? Well, we have a couple Almost, of group right in do you? Google. Oh, yeah? I mean, this, you, can, you can speak, there's always somewhere to speak. You know, we, at the very beginning, we've done a whole bunch of talks, but at the very beginning, we just, we just called some of our friends and we said, we've got this book coming out. Um, could you, we come at lunch and just do an hour long thing? Say, yeah, why not? I mean, so you can always just browbeat people to let you talk. <laughs> and at the very worst, you do what I call the cocktail party test. No matter where you are with anybody at any time, as tedious as it might be, you just start telling them your idea. <laughs> And if you, know, you say, my new, my new idea is blah, 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 and if their response is, oh, that's really interesting because I was thinking the same thing, you know you're onto something. If their response is, so where'd you spend your vacation? 
then <laughs> you probably have not hit it yet. You know? so you, but you can always find a place to talk. It's a really good question. Anybody else? Yeah. Uh, this is a question about, uh, I don't care what you call it, but the sort of canonical form, like the, 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 the iconic the, moments. You mean the, well, the, the, the sort of idealized form of the idea that you put out there. Yeah. The, yeah. Um, I'm sorry? The sacred, sacred, sacred expression. Oh, the sacred expression. Sacred yeah. expression. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. There are, I've, I've seen a pattern, various few data points, of looks like the long tail, uh, motion strategies, um, you know, some of these, these, uh, these uh, sort of big business books. Yeah, big idea big business idea books. Big idea business books. Yeah. That started with or mapped to a an article, article in, you know, Wired or, or in uh, HBR. HBR, something like that. Yeah. And um, I've always found my path through has been someone points me at the article, read the article, get really excited about it, read the book, you're like, why did that take 200 more pages to say the same thing that was in the article? Yeah. Um, yeah. Is, are those authors doing the right thing by writing the books, or are they, you know, or should they just? You know, well, I think there are two answers to that. One is many of those articles are written after the book is written, and they couldn't write the article until they read the book, because they had to go through the process of writing the book to get all those ideas. And then it's so wonderful because you can just squish them down into an article. That's why the article is so good. And so often you'll find that the article, the articles that are less good, do not come from a book. If you, a lot of stuff you read in New Yorker, New Yorker, for example, is excerpted from books. So you, know, you get the benefit of all that extra work in this article. Um, but yeah, I mean, very often you don't need the rest of it. But you do need the book. And what, what we've come to the conclusion is that all idea entrepreneurs need a book. <laughs> it may not be their sacred expression, but they need a book. And I can't tell you, people come to me and say, you know, I'm talking, I just did my TED talk, I've been blogging like crazy, I've got to have the book, everybody wants the book. And when you think about it, I mean, it, the book does a lot of things for you that nothing else does. So, I mean, people still think of it as sort of the ultimate uh, emblem of learning. You know, I can write a book, we've been told forever that book, a book is the ultimate expression. Um, it's, it's this very handy device you can just hand to people. It is a, it's an entry to the Ideaplex, because that's how you get interviews. Say, his new book, as opposed to he just posted a cat video. You know, <laughs> that does not get you on Charlie Rose. You got to have so it's the book does a lot of things for you, but you know your criticism is 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 to, is, is, is uh, very well taken. Many people feel the same way. Do I need to read this entire book? And often often you don't. Uh, we we did. Um, We've not written an article in HBR, but we've done articles in various different places, yeah. Other questions? Yes. So what is the metric that you are measuring yourself against for the many tweets, <laughs> the, um, the number of, number fewer clients that come to knock on our door. <laughs> what is the metric? That's, that's a really good one. Um, the one-on-one on, on one metric really means the most to me. And that's what I'm paying most attention to. So um, that's kind of what I'm focusing on now. And we're still still in the early days here, but um, you know, if, if we could if we could hear people say, if we could get this this model out there, and um, get some sense that people are kind of evaluating ideas through this model, that would be great. Great. Thank you very much.